think it's a very exciting time to be working on longevity. So um, now uh, I think I prepared a slightly different presentation, um, like I did actually two years ago when I was in New York for, for the last time um, for an um, in-person conference uh, on this topic. Uh, I think I, I like to bounce a couple of different ideas and thoughts, um, which I'll, I'll do again today. So, but for, first, let me tell you a little bit um, more about my background, which is not on my bio, which is why I work on aging. I've never made it a secret. I, I do mention it on, uh, on my personal website. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, but you probably don't like to think about it. Uh, we are all going to die. And um, if we don't do something about aging, it is going to be fairly soon, I would argue, at least from a cosmological perspective. Uh, now, back when I was a, a child, I realized this. I realized, you know, everybody ages and dies, and I figured, you know, I'll, I'll do something about aging. I will find a cure for aging, just like we can find cures against diseases, like, you know, infectious diseases, and we have antibiotics that can cure diseases that we couldn't treat, you know, not that long ago. Um, I will fix aging. That's that's what I'm going to do in my career. So, so it's not about, um, you know, just, just money or other um, goals. My goal is to find a cure for aging. So that's why I became interested in the topic. And I'm not the only one. I think Alison mentioned a, a similar story in her interview earlier today. So, okay, so that, that that's the goal. And of course, things have advanced a lot in the past uh, few decades. Uh, we know in particular that aging can be retarded. Actually, we've known that aging can be retarded for quite a long time. Um, so from a perspective of caloric restriction in particular, we know that we can retard delay aging in mammals, specifically in rodents, um, by caloric restriction. So that's been known for about, uh, at least 80 years. Um, so, so we know that aging can be retarded. And you see there a, a, a plot of rats fed at libitum and fed uh, under caloric restriction. There is a significant difference. It varies between strains, but you can see an increase in lifespan up to 50% in some strains, and it retards the process of aging, delays age-related diseases. We also know that aging can be manipulated, it can be retarded genetically in, in model systems like worms, flies, and mice. Um, Lorna mentioned this a little bit earlier today in her talk. Um, thanks to the work of pioneers like Cynthia Kenyon, now at Calico, we know you can tweak genes and significantly extend lifespan in animal models, which, which is, again, quite remarkable. Um, and likewise, we now know of drugs that can retard aging in animals. Um, we've heard a bit about rapamycin already and metformin. So, you know, I, I'm sure this audience is, is familiar with these developments. We know that there are longevity drugs that at least in animal models, they can retard age, they can extend lifespan. The only thing that's important to mention here to emphasize is that the benefits of this well, the longevity effects are relatively modest when compared to, to other interventions like caloric restriction or genetic manipulations in particular. So I think rapamycin extends lifespan like 10, 15%, depending on males or females. Um, metformin, uh, I believe um, yeah, less than that. Um, so so we, have, um, we have many ways of extending lifespan with pharmacological approaches, but the effects are smaller than what you see uh, with, for example, genetic manipulations. Um, and there's lots of interest in longevity pharmacology. Um, this is a, a plot from our drug age database of aging related drugs. And as you can see, there's an exponential increase in the numbers of drugs associated with longevity. There's lots of interest in it. Basically, because if we're gonna translate findings from, uh, from model systems to humans, I mean, we cannot, at least not yet, do genetic manipulations. We, we have to do pharmacological approaches. It's the low hanging fruit that, I mean, Aubrey alluded to earlier on. So there are some difficulties. I mean, I'm very excited personally about longevity drugs. Um, there's challenges. Um, I think Peter made the point that humans are not mice or, or worms or flies or yeast for that matter. There is a gap of you know, translating discoveries between animal models and humans, not just in aging, but, but I would say biomedical research in general and for many diseases. So that, that's a, a challenge that we are aware of. Um, so not everything we discover in animal models is gonna pan out in humans, but possibly something will. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic in that sense. I know not everything is gonna work in humans, but some things are gonna work in humans. And if they do, and they retard aging in humans, then that's gonna be uh, a tremendous benefit. And of course, 
there's tremendous uh, financial benefits as well. And that's why we have this fast growth in longevity biotech, in the longevity industry. Um, there's a lot of companies now focusing on, I mean, well, we've heard of, uh, from Jacob from Calico already. Um, so there is rapid growth in the longevity industry because investors, because uh, you know, a lot of uh, even bigger companies, uh, they, they think that they're gonna make money out of the longevity field. Um, which, as I say, I think it's it's probably right. I do think, well, I think a lot of companies are going to fail, but some of them will succeed um, and they will make a lot of money. So I do think that the longevity biotech has a, in general, uh, has a bright future ahead. Uh, we can, we'll be able to retard age. Having said that, there is a problem. Well, at least, you know, going back to that child, so that that's, a photo of me when I was a child doing my homework on top of the dinner table. Um, so is that longevity drugs are not really a cure. Uh, I mean, they will extend lifespan. And if we could extend lifespan in humans by 5% by retarding aging, they would already have tremendous benefits, medical, health, social, economic benefits. But that's not really a cure for aging. So even if we develop longevity drugs, um, we're still facing death and eternal oblivion. So that's still, in, in my book at least, that counts as a failure. That means I'm still gonna die. So we need to figure out other ways of intervening in aging. And so, and that's why in addition to looking at retarding aging and longevity drugs, you know, there's also this emerging field of rejuvenation. So, so what about rejuvenation as, as therapies, as approaches? Now, it's not so, so new. I mean, people have been talking about rejuvenation for quite a long time. So, so back when I was, that's a photo of me when I was at university. Uh, and back when I was at university, I bought this book from uh, Michael Fossil called Reversing Human Danger. Um, that promised that science um, perhaps discovered the true fountain of youth that would make you younger and keep you that way, uh, hand cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's and stroke, and change life as we know it. Um, the book was published, I checked in 1997. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that's when I bought it, but well, I should tell you a little bit about my age as well. Now, the book focuses on one discovery that happened in the late 90s, and that's the discovery of telomerase, the, the enzyme that um, elongates the telomeres, repairs, elongates the telomeres, uh, and allows cells to evade cell replicative senescence. It can immortalize cells. Now, since, since um, I mean, I did actually did my PhD in cell senescence, so it's interesting for a variety of reasons, but I'll just focus on a couple of them. First of all, is the complex process. So these are uh, photos of young fibroblasts and senescent fibroblasts. And there's a lot of changes between young fibroblasts to senescent fibroblasts. And people used to think that there was a stochastic process behind it. Um, and it turns out that no, actually, um, in human fibroblast senescence, you know, it's very clear, very clear timekeeper, which is telomeres. Uh, so telomere shortening with cell division, and that triggers replicative senescence. So it's a very simple driver to a complex process, a complex phenotype. And of course, telomerase um, elongates the telomeres and prevents replicative senescence and uh, immortalize human fibroblasts, human cells. So that's you know quite remarkable discovery in itself, and, um, and received the Nobel Prize. Um, but what about aging of, of organisms? So the point is that, of course, immortalizing cells, it's very different from immortalizing organisms. So although we can immortalize human cells, um, well, we cannot really, do it, not really, as I mentioned, changing genes in humans is not really that practical at the moment, but we can do these experiments in mice. We can activate, we can have mice with lots of telomerase. Um, and, you know, without digging into a long, um, literature, this doesn't really immortalize animals. In fact, it doesn't really even extend their longevity. I think that, well, that there's one paper by Maria Blasco and colleagues suggesting that gene therapy of telomerase extends lifespan in mice, but to my knowledge, that's never been replicated. So I take it with a grain of salt. Uh, the point is, and this is a, a paper review I published several years ago, but I stand by its conclusions, is that telomeres are, and telomerase are not really a, mount, a modern fountain of youth. So, so by and large, did this really has not panned out the way you know, the Michael Fossil book 1997 promised. So, okay, so that's, I mean, what happened in the past. 
Um, there's a couple of other caveats, you know, kind of a side uh, notes I would like to mention. Um, improved function, improved, is not necessarily uh, rejuvenation. You can have, be healthier, you can have a better functional outcomes, and not necessarily be rejuvenated. Um, and I'll show you actually one example uh, of people who underwent, I wouldn't say therapies, but they, they underwent changes that reduces their chances of diseases, it retards their um, onset of diseases, it increases their uh, life expectancy, it increases their function, and yet did not rejuvenate. So these are people that went on exercise, um, particularly overweight uh, men and women that went on exercise um, regimes, um, which is healthy, of course, for them. That's great. I mean, I think if you're overweight, you should exercise. That's not going to make you younger. That's not going to rejuvenate you, but it's going to make you healthier. And by chance, it's going to allow you to live longer. It's going to reduce your chance of developing diseases, but it's not rejuvenation. Now, the reason I mentioned this is that I do think we, you know, we do see a lot of hype, I think, around rejuvenation. Um, well, I think around longevity as well, um, which was something I, I believe Aubrey touched upon as well. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a gray area. It's a, it's a, that's a fine line between it. But there's a lot of studies that you know, they, they do something to mice and the mice show some functional improvements. Uh, and they say, oh, we rejuvenated the animal. That's not necessarily true. Um, you just made the animal healthier or improve its function, but that's not necessarily rejuvenation. I think extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So if you're claiming rejuvenation, you need to really show that that's what you are um, achieving. Now, the other um, caveat I would say in this context is that you know, there are differences between short and long-term effects. So I'll show you one example from historical um, uh, in biogerontology which is uh, growth hormone. Now we've known for, for quite a long time, I believe from the past century, that the levels of growth hormone decline in, in human beings. So this is levels of growth hormone with age in humans and they decline. Um, and therefore you know, there were therapies with growth hormone and growth hormone can have benefits. It can improve your function. It can have short-term benefits. It can increase muscle mass, immune function, it can increase libido. So it can have short-term health benefits. But again, it doesn't mean that it is rejuvenating. In fact, it's probably not even good for longevity. Um, so we know, for example, for many studies in mice, that mice with low levels of growth hormone signaling, they actually live longer. So what you see here are actually two mice of the same age. The small mice is a dwarf mouse, which has low levels of growth hormone signaling. Um, and it's actually going to be long lived. It's going to live significantly longer than its um, counterpart that's wild type and has a normal growth hormone signaling. Um, and possibly even there's, there's some data, I think, from Andrew Bartke suggesting that growth hormone may even accelerate mouse aging. So, so if you have high, very high levels of growth hormone, this may even accelerate mouse aging. I mean, the details are not important. The point is that you can have short-term health and functional benefits from an intervention that in the long-term become detrimental. So again, it's important to, to consider that from a perspective of you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, and that's why I, I have some skepticism by a lot of advances that are touted as rejuvenation. Now, there is one intervention that's been talked about, which is um, cell reprogramming and uh, Yamanaka factors induced pluripotency as a way of rejuvenating cells. Um, and at the cell level, that does appear to rejuvenate cells. I think that there's abundant evidence from that. I think this, uh, this is a slide I took from a paper from the Ocampo lab in Switzerland. But uh, I mean, Daniel before me talked a lot about this, um, Jacob from Calico as well. So, so we've heard quite a lot. So cell reprogramming, can rejuvenate cells. I, I do think there's, there's quite abundant evidence for that. It, re, it resets the epigenetic clock from, from Steve Orvath and so on. So it does rejuvenate cells. Of course, the, the question is, I mean, you know, what happens in cells is not necessarily what happens in, in organisms. So they're quite different. You know, rejuvenating cells and rejuvenating an organism, they're different things. Just like for telomerase, we had uh, immortalized cells in a Petri dish that doesn't mean we have immortalized organisms. They're quite different. Um, now, the jury's still out. I think we, well, again, we heard previous speakers um, talk about, well, this experiment from Alejandro Campo 
in, uh, in protoroid mice, which seems promising, but it's a protoroid, it's an accelerated, very short-lived mouse model. So again, I would take it with a, with a grain of salt. Um, so it is still an open question whether this um, cell reprogramming could rejuvenate organisms in the same way it rejuvenates cells. So I think it's still an open question. Maybe, maybe it will, that would be fantastic. Uh, maybe it will be like telomerase that works at the cell level, but doesn't quite work the same way on an organismal level. And there may be even other methods for rejuvenation. I think it was very interesting the, the talk by, by uh, Jacob on, um, uh, on how we've known for decades since the, the, the work of, uh, of Gurdon that uh, you can go back in biological time, um, for example, with cloning. So I think that that really from a conceptual perspective opens the door to developing artificial methods of uh, of rejuvenation. So in theory, it is possible, but you know, there's still a lot of uh, way to go. And it may not, uh, in the end, from a, a practical perspective, may turn out not to be possible. Uh, we don't know, but we still need to do uh, those experiments, of course. Um, okay, so, so, all right, so there's been a lot of advances in longevity, in particular pharmacological, but well, genetic, dietary, and pharmacological levels. There's been a lot of advances in retarding age-related diseases and retarding the process of aging. We've known for, for decades about that, and there's been a lot of advances, um, and that's great. I, I don't think longevity and rejuvenation are mutually exclusive. I think we need both of them uh, in the field. Um, but in, in order really to, to prevent us from, from dying, uh, we need uh, much more than longevity interventions. We need uh, rejuvenation interventions. Now, there's a couple of problems in you know, moving in that direction. The first problem is that I would argue um, we have a poor mechanistic understanding of aging. Now, in my talk in, well, in New York, in the, the last Ending Aging, Ending Aging um, Diseases uh, conference, um, I mentioned a slide on how I was quite skeptic about the hallmarks of aging. Now, in the past uh, two years, um, and uh, in collaboration with David Jens in London, we kind of expanded on that. Um, and we just uh, published a, a perspective in aging research reviews, a critique of the hallmarks of aging uh, as a paradigm. So, so our argument is that the hallmarks of aging are, are excellent as a review. Um, I think they're excellent as an introduction to aging, but they do not necessarily explain aging. They are not the um, holy grail or the, the uh, you know, the commandments of aging that some people make it or assume they are. They are hypotheses and they could be completely wrong. Um, and we have the example of telomerase. People, if you look at the older literature, um, people used to argue that there was a lot of mechanisms in cellular senescence, lots, lots of things going on. Mitochondria would change, this would change, lots of mechanisms. It's not that, actually, it's just one thing, which is telomerase, telomere shortening, um, and that is the driver of cellular senescence in, in human fibroblasts. There's nothing else to it. Um, there may be in other cell types, but in human fibroblasts, that's it. Um, but the point is that um, what we think we know about mechanisms of aging could be completely wrong. Um, and in, that includes the hallmarks of aging, um, and that includes um, uh, from a mechanistic understanding of aging that in, implies having an open mind to it, but also be skeptic about what we think we know. And that is a problem if we're on to, to intervene in aging, in particular, if we want to rejuvenate um, ourselves. The other uh, uh, problem or another problem that uh, I think already picked up uh, as well is that science funding is quite conservative. Um, you know, investors, um, so in the private sector, they're looking for a return of investment. So they're looking to, to make money out of an investment. Therefore, they're gonna look for a low hanging fruit, um, which is not necessarily you know, from a rejuvenation perspective, what we want. You want to have more long-term thinking. Uh, likewise, I mean, I'm mostly an academic also, although I'm also working for a company at the moment, as I'll mention uh, in a minute or two. Um, but academia also quite conservative in the sense that grant funding bodies tend to be very risk adverse. Um, I'll have a couple of minutes, so I'll tell you, actually tell you a, a quick story. Um, about a year ago, more than a year ago, actually, I applied for a grant for uh, UK government funding. And the grant was about applying machine learning to, uh, to predict 
uh, drug combinations in the context of longevity. So predict if you combine two drugs that extend lifespan, whether they're going to have synergistic, antagonistic, or neutral effects, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I think uh, we know a lot of longevity drugs, but we don't know how they work together. And if we can find combinations, they're going to be synergistic. So, so that got funded. That's great. I mean, the project uh, was supposed to start already, but there's been some delays because of COVID. So we're, we're now actually recruiting someone to, to work on that project. We should begin um, as soon as we can recruit someone to work on it. So that's great. Um, at about the same time, I'd apply for another grant looking at cell reprogramming. Uh, and the idea was, can we identify factors that allow us to rejuvenate cells without the differentiation? Uh, and that was rejected because they thought it was too, um, I wouldn't say ambitious, but too risky to do that. I mean, I don't have a track record of working on cell reprogramming. Um, you know, it was, uh, it, it was rejected. So, but the, the point is, you know, the money between the two was pretty much the same, where it was similar. If I had a choice, I would prefer to do the cell reprogramming project. It's riskier, but I think it's much more ambitious. That's what I would like to do. And unfortunately, as an academic, I'm limited to what I can get funding for my lab. And even though I've been fairly successful getting grant funding, um, it's not necessarily to what I think are the most exciting projects. In fact, I would, I would say my most, the projects I tend to be more excited about tend to be rejected by grant funding bodies because they have, they're much more conservative and they're risk adverse. Um, and that is, I think, a problem of academia. And even if you know, I would like to do more ambitious, more risky research in my lab, I'm still restricted by what I can get funding for. So anyway, that's, that's uh, one of the restrictions we have or one of the limitations I think we have in, in academia. So the point is that science funding is conservative and, and that I think prevents the, the more risky approaches. Now, having said that, um, I am also now working for a company, Centaura. I'm the CSO of Centaura uh, since, since uh, last year. It's gonna be one year very soon actually, um, which focuses on reversing aging. Um, I mean, I can tell you it's, it's, it's in the public domain that one of the technologies we're developing is human artificial chromosomes, uh, which is actually something I was thinking about when I was in, in when I was a student as a way of, of reversing aging. So I think that's quite exciting. Um, and it's something I'm quite, uh, uh, you know, of course, it may fail completely, but if it works, it would give us a tool in which we could much more powerfully intervene in aging. So that, that's what attracted me. To, uh, to take on this role. It's really this, this prospect of having a, a, a powerful technology to not just slow down aging, but potentially reverse aging. Um, and I mean, you can find more information on, on our website. So, uh, I mean, the last uh, point I will make is that, um, you know, in terms of, of hype and how much do we want, I mean, from a PR perspective, how should we place the field, which is something I, I, you know, I've been trying to, to raise awareness about longevity and aging for, for, for 20 years now, actually. Um, I do think we do need a narrative. We need some sort of storytelling that is ambitious. And if you look at other fields, they do so as well. I mean, you know, Alzheimer's, cancer, all, all the, the institutions, charities or, or, or foundations or even government initiatives working on diseases, they want to find a cure. They don't just want to slow down Alzheimer's. The ultimate goal is to find a cure. So I think that's fine. I think saying that we want to cure aging is fine. I, I know aging is somewhat more controversial, but that's something we have to address. It is fine to say long-term we want to find a cure. And I don't see that, that there's um, any problems with that. Sure, you know, what we're discovering so far, I mean, we're still quite far from that point, but having that long-term ambitious, uh, I think it's, it's something that the field needs. So in summary, I've, um, I've told you from a, a longevity perspective, there's very fast growth. We can retard aging in, in animals in many different ways, uh, you know, dietary, uh, that we've known for decades, pharmacological approaches, genetic approaches, there are many different ways of retarding aging. So, and, and that's very exciting. I think the longevity field is really expanding a lot from since I started um, a little over 20 years ago. So there's many more scientists, bigger, um, companies focusing on much many more uh, startups and longevity companies and I think that's fantastic. Um, rejuvenation however I think it's much harder I mean longevity or retarding aging we can only do so much in terms of um, animal models even. 
rejuvenation is much harder for a variety of reasons, including, a, I think, a lack of mechanistic understanding of aging. Uh, at the moment, I would argue that we do have one way that can rejuvenate cells, which is cell reprogramming, but whether that's going to work in, in organisms remains to be seen. Um, I told you about our ambition in Centaur about reversing aging, particularly developing cell and gene therapies uh, based on uh, developing technologies for human artificial chromosomes. Um, and, and lastly, I told you that we do need to take some risks um, in, in the approaches we take uh, or we will die. Now, I mean, again, I don't assume and I don't argue that uh, everyone should want to prevent their death. I mean, I, that, that's, I think that's a personal decision. Um, but if our goal is really to cure aging, then we need to take some risks. We need to take the risks at having more uh, ambitious research. It might fail, might not get us papers or, or products for our companies, but we need to take those risks um, if we want to really develop these rejuvenation technologies. Um, and so with that, I, I would just, um, you know, uh, well, I think I'm, I'm out of time. So this is, well, all the, the lab in Liverpool and, uh, and our funders. And if you want more information about either our lab or, or the company, uh, please check out our website and feel free to, to get in touch. And uh, thank you very much for your time and attention.